uh, SED. I want to welcome everyone to our final SED seminar for 2021. Um, a reminder, we will be starting back up in uh, February with our spring series. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Danielle Eisman today, who is our speaker, and she is going to present to us uh, Stand Up for Science, how stand-up comedy and storytelling can break the science communication paradox. And by way of introduction, uh, Danielle Eisman, Eisman is currently a visiting lecturer at Cornell University in the Department of Communication. Her expertise is focused on pro-environmental behavior change and science communication. She is particularly interested in how different engagement tools such as storytelling, food, and social media can help accelerate public engagement in climate science, science, policy, and action. Specific interests include public engagement with climate change policy, peer-to-peer -peer learning, storytelling, and stand-up comedy for public engagement, and the use of food experiences for telling the climate change story. Danielle Eisman has a PhD in consumer behavior, uh, Master of Science in Carbon Management, and Master of Science in Economics and Marketing, and a BA in Chemistry. So it's my pleasure to welcome Danielle Eisman, and just as a reminder, recording this. So Danielle, all yours, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to, to be here and to be talking about this topic, which really has uh, come out of my my teaching. So I teach a course on science writing for media and, and over the, the several years that I've been teaching this course, I've become more and more interested in using the technique of stand up comedy as well as storytelling to increase public engagement with science. So I'm excited to share this with you and, and get your reactions and get some feedback from you as well. So a little bit about me um, kind of beyond what, what Cynthia had just um, described is really, I, you know, I have this endless curiosity and that has brought me to this point in time where now, even though I still don't see myself as a communication scholar, I teach very technical communication courses um, such as risk communication, science writing for media um, and communication and the environment. I also want to note that I am not a trained comedian, so laughs are not guaranteed during this talk. Um, although, you know, when I normally give lectures, I have a very captive audience and I also control their grades, so I, I'm accustomed to getting a lot of laughs. Um, so I, I won't be offended if, if I don't get any laughs here. Um, and so what has really driven my pursuit of, of this topic and my interest in it, not just from a, a teaching perspective, but also from a research perspective, is just these ongoing issues of, of science skepticism. And there's, um, you know, the 3M group, they, um, you know, despite their, their industrial practices, they also conduct an annual survey on the state of science. And they'll conduct a survey, um, typically they'll focus on 14 different countries and usually a thousand people in each country. And so they've been able to kind of have um, or provide a report on the, the state of science across the globe. And what they've seen repeatedly is that there is still a lot of skepticism towards science and they emphasize the importance of effective science communication in order to make science much more relatable. And that's why we have certain issues that arise such as um, you know, anti-masking protests, flat earthers, uh, the, the other image at the top there is from a newsletter that is typically, it used to be put out at the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change meetings. So the group ECO, they're no longer uh, producing those newsletters, but this was after the, um, this was at the subsidiary body meeting in Bonn in 2019, and it was after the United States, Australia, and I think Japan had refused to acknowledge or accept the information from the 1.5 degree report uh, in terms of embedding that into or helping align certain policies that were going towards the next COP. Um, and so that was the sentiment there that, you know, there's still this skepticism of science, um, especially when it comes to very important issues that affect society. But then, you know, it's not just this problem of, of a, um, 
distrust in science, we also have these two phenomenon that are described within the science communication literature. And the first is this concept of the knowledge ignorance paradox developed by Ungar in 2000. And so Ungar says that oversaturation of the information environment has created these specific groups that are very focused or have um, distinctive knowledge that really isn't shared as widely as it could be. So there's this barrier between experts and the public, and that creates this paradox between those experts and the public. And then we also have this um, science communication paradox, which is described by Daniel Cahan. Um, and he wrote an essay in 2015 outlining this science communication paradox, which says that our world has never been so advanced, and yet collectively we tend to disagree on so many issues. And those sentiments were um, you know, expressed on that previous slide where we have, you know, tremendous knowledge and understanding about the um, importance of vaccinations, and yet we have disagreements about it. We understand that climate change is uh, a direct impact of human activities, and yet we have disagreements on that. And so this creates this science communication paradox where the scientific knowledge is just not reaching the groups that really need to understand that knowledge. And if we think about what is causing this, you know, there's three main uh, things that we could attribute this to. <clears throat> and the first is that concept of the ivory tower, where there's a, a general distrust uh, in certain institutions, as well as growing sentiments of anti-intellectualism, where um, and I've experienced this, unfortunately, within my own family, where researchers or scientists are perceived as someone that's just trying to get grant funding or federal dollars in order to support their own agenda. Um, and so it creates this ongoing distrust. And then even, um, I'm not sure if you experience similar situations where you are in Boston, but, you know, here in Ithaca, there's a, a, a divide between um, you know, the institution and the town. So, you know, going back to that idea of town and gown or town versus gown, where there's this kind of distrust between the community surrounding the institution and the institution. There's also significant cutbacks for knowledge producing institutions, such as museums, which are much more approachable for the general public in terms of understanding science and engaging with science. So those informal institutions and educational experiences are very valuable for people that may have been intimidated in the past by uh, seeking out scientific information. Um, so, you know, by having these cutbacks in those institutions, it then reduces the resources available to then increase those scientific engagement opportunities. And then we have the aspect of the attention economy. So increasing pressure for novel information or interesting information. And what tends to win out in the attention economy is information that is a little bit, um, you know, uh, exciting or salacious, uh, whereas scientific information isn't doesn't have that same kind of effect on people. So it could be a challenge to compete against that type of information. And this is attributed to a concept called the novelty hypothesis. Um, and so what we see is that false news is spread much more quickly um, and much more widely than true or accurate information. And the people that share this information quickly or are the first ones to share this information are perceived as someone that is in the know or they tend to have a higher status. And so this just presents ongoing challenges for um, you know, people that are trying to disseminate their science, disseminate their research or share their information much more widely. And then we also have to consider the audience. And so this is information from the, the US Census um, as well as that 3M state of the science report. So most of the people in the American population, um, only 37% have a degree in STEM. Um, and even if they have a degree in STEM, it doesn't mean that they actually work in STEM. And so 
a high school education or undergraduate education might be the last time that most people engage with science in a meaningful way. And so it can be very difficult to then convince them or, or entice them to pay attention to certain scientific information. But also what we've seen is that scientists are perceived as unapproachable. Um, so even though they're perceived as being highly credible, they're still lacking that kind of human connection where people want to engage with them in a way that's meaningful um, and they want to understand more and more about their research. So there's, there's something that could be enhanced there in order to bring out that, that human connection between experts and non-experts. And if we think about the way that most of us communicate, especially in scientific fields, um, you know, we, we do it in a very specific way and, and much of it is attributed to that traditional um, academic article or journal article format. And, you know, most of that information is behind the paywall. It uses very specific language um, and it is unapproachable for most of the general public, either in terms of the cost because of the, the paywall or in terms of the language use that is you know, very specific to um, you know, different or distinctive academic groups. And so that presents a challenge for most of the general public to try and engage with this information in a meaningful way. And so that brings us to humor and storytelling. And if we think about science, um, you know, it, that tends to be a uniquely human characteristic, that pursuit of knowledge and applying it and testing it. Um, and so do humor and storytelling, although there are other social creatures that do have humor and they laugh. Um, but looking at the aspect of, of humor and comedy, as well as storytelling, they tend to be very distinctly human. And so, you know, if we think about what is so unique about both of these um, approaches, well, humor is thought to be a fundamental aspect of the human experience and also helps deconstruct uh, social meanings and allows us better insights into otherwise invisible structures. And so some of the, the topics that we're able to approach through humor breaks down some of the tensions that we might feel on a, towards difficult topics, um, you know, especially larger societal problems like racism or um, uh, sexual harassment. And so using humor, it helps to break down some of those tensions. Also storytelling, it, it helps build connections between people as well as people and ideas. And they convey culture, history, goals that help unite people. Also, what I, what I do with my students is we take stories that turn our failures into victories. And so I have my students create stories where they have failed at something, but it really led to a much deeper, um, a deeper lesson and a deeper success. And they're able to build these strong connections with each other through that shared theme of turning a failure into a victory. Um, and they help create a culture of compassion, as well as stories are human. They really emphasize that human aspect of, of how we are connected. And you know, again, that's something that is unique to science that we don't always get to convey or share with people that you know, what's driving these questions, what's driving our motivations to study the world around us is very human. And so we might think of science as an unemotional, objective, straightforward type of process. But if you think about the core motivation of what gets you up and out of bed every morning, that is a very human aspect. And we don't talk about that enough. We don't talk about those drivers. And so, you know, leave it to, leave it to science to take the fun out of humor. So if we think about what is humor? There are three main theories that help explain why we have humor. So the first one is superiority theory, um, where we tend to laugh at someone else uh, for the sake of feeling superior. So that's kind of a, a negative way of approaching humor. And we use it as a way to demonstrate status or to make 
others feel feel bad. Um, and so that's a negative way that humor can be used in social situations. Um, there's also relief theory, and that's probably the most widely um, widely known or widely experienced form of humor in that, you know, as we laugh about a situation, then, you know, our shoulders drop, our cortisol levels drop, we, we have, you know, we start to feel a little bit more relaxed um, and we're enjoying ourselves. Um, and so that's a really great way to tap into um, humor and use it in a way to bridge some of these gaps that some people may feel if, especially if they're intimidated by scientific information or interacting with scientists. And then incongruity theory suggests that we laugh at things that are inconsistent with our existing knowledge or are unconventional or incongruent with what we know about the world. Um, and that's kind of a spontaneous form of humor that where we see something that doesn't quite match up with what we're expecting. And so, you know, there has been a significant amount of research done on using humor in the um, political space of communication. And so research shows that it works in the political context. Um, and so there was a study done, especially on the John Oliver show, and it shows that although this presents much more of a political perspective, um, you know, people do tend to become more curious and much more, um, much more interested in seeking out information about politics after watching these types of shows. And so that has become a really interesting outcome of understanding or applying humor to difficult topics. So it hasn't been studied as widely. Um, I think there's only two or three studies that have looked at the impact of comedy on science engagement and science curiosity. So it's kind of an untapped area for research. And then we also see that there's there can be some negative associations with using humor. So um, in looking at some of these um, much more prevalent political satires, we see that political satire influences attitudes towards particular candidates. And this is most attributed to, or most recently attributed to something called the Tina Fey effect. So there was um, on Saturday Night Live, Tina Fey pretended to be, uh, Vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin. And in one of the skits, she um, she said, Oh, I think I can see Russia from my house, indicating that she, you know, living in Alaska, she could see Russia. And um, because that political satire was so powerful, um, many people amongst the public attributed that quote to Sarah Palin as opposed to. Tina Fey. Um, and so, you know, even though we see that um, political satire and comedy can increase people's curiosity about specific topics, um, it can have negative effects on it as well. Um, just looking at the impacts that it has on the favorability or the perceptions of a, of a certain candidate. Um, but then if we start to apply this or think about this in terms of science communication, one of the, the biggest points that is often raised towards me or to me um, from different academic groups is, well, not everyone is funny. Um, and that is true. <laughs> so, as much as we, we try, um, it can be a challenge to think of yourself as, as someone that can be humorous or that can tell a humorous story. Um, and this in itself is very intimidating. So we think, um, you know, when I forced my students to perform stand up comedy in class, they said it's the, the most frightening thing that they've ever done. Uh, but then after that, they feel relieved um, and they're glad that they did it. And so if you think about how do you actually be funny, um, you know, there isn't necessarily a, a concrete formula, but there are these general guidelines so you can compare and contrast um your own observations or or your own experiences in your work um, with experiences of you know 
things that people experience on an everyday basis. Uh, taking the familiar or taking the unfamiliar and connecting it to the familiar. And that's probably one of the biggest obstacles for the general public in terms of understanding science communication is really taking abstract ideas and connecting it to their daily lives. And so humor, if you're able to take some of those concepts that are very unfamiliar and connect them to the familiar, uh, that could be very helpful and an engaging way to um, increase public engagement in science. Um, and also humanize the work, um, you know, that it's not just some abstract scientist that's standing at a bench or sitting at a computer screen conducting these experiments or overseeing these experiments. There's, as I mentioned before, this, this drive, this motivation that is forcing you to do this work, that you you seek out the answers to this question that you have every single day. And I think most people don't realize that or we don't talk about that enough. And then also playing into your personality. So if you're if you're dry, be dry. If you're goofy, be goofy. Um, you know, really lean into who you are, um, which is really a great way to be humorous in in those types of situations. So if you were to actually perform in a stand up comedy, you want to lean into your personality and, and don't try to be someone that you're not. And so, you know, it's kind of a basic structure. And, and I've gone through this training myself where I, I performed stand up comedy. And, and this was really it. This was this was the training. Compare and contrast what you know, and what you see, make the, the unfamiliar familiar, humanize the work and then lean into your personality. Which brings me to my own experience. So I performed stand up comedy in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, it was part of an organization called Bright Club. And I was forced to do it because my my friend, um, I asked him to give a networking presentation to uh, fellow PhD students. And he said, I will do it as long as you perform in Bright Club. And I really wanted him to come and speak. So I agreed to be a performer at the next Bright Club. And so thinking about my own work and how I could make that funny, it was a, a difficult task. So, you know, my, my PhD was really focused on climate change, understanding sustainable consumer behavior. Um, and I, I did that in the context of a group called the Literati. So it's a, an Instagram community that picks up litter all across the world and they post it on Instagram. Um, and then the conceptual framework that I use was evolutionary psychology. And, and so I go into this training and thinking about how I can make this more relatable to people. How can I make it humorous? What are the words that I could um, you know, choose to entice people? And so this was the result. <laughs> But hopefully it's something we all agree is happening. And it's something that we all really need to work on to try and solve. Now, as I said a couple of times, I'm just a PhD student. So unfortunately, you're not gonna get any groundbreaking ideas from me. <laughs> just ask my supervisors. <laughs> Luckily, there are quite a few people out there working on some really great solutions like renewable energy, sustainable products, plans to colonize other Earth-like planets. <laughs> Unfortunately, it might be quite a bit of time before we realize the benefits of those solutions. So what's left? Consumption. Now I know changing our consumption is very difficult. Walking up and down High Street, there's oh so many wants. So um, it was just a brief clip um, and I weave in, um, you know, other aspects of my work. Uh, I tried to pick the, the part that was the least kind of politically charged and most relatable. So, um, you know, but then I, I get into how I spend my PhD research going out in my pajamas, picking up litter and, and taking photos of it. And, you know, litter, another word for litter is trash. So I say I, I'm always outside picking up trash and that explains most of my dating history, you know, and so getting into some of those concepts and, and again, making it relatable and, and 
kind of comparing and contrasting what I'm doing scientifically with other experiences that people be, may be a bit more familiar with. And then I tie that into concepts from evolutionary psychology on mate retention and marriage and, and social status. Um, and I, I have that little QR code there. So again, this is people ask to see the full bit, um, but that would be way too long to play here with you all. So if you wanted to actually view it um, where I'm not squirming watching myself on video, um, you can access it there. But I think, you know, the benefits of this, so even though it's a completely terrifying experience, um, it ends up being really, really rewarding because it, it broadens that impact of your work in a way that you may not have thought of. So I never would have imagined standing up in a comedy club and talking about my research. Um, and it was actually, it was at that point in your PhD where you hate everything and everybody and you question your entire existence. Um, and it was very motivating to receive that type of reaction and the, and the, the renewed interest in my work. And so I found it a very valuable experience because it kind of reinvigorated my, um, my motivation to kind of hurry up and finish my PhD and, and finish the writing. Um, it also helps with your presenting and communication skills. So it, it's, you know, because it is so much more intimidating, because not only do you have to convey information that is educational, but you also have to try to make it funny, um, which is something that we're just not accustomed to. So, you know, that's, it's a, it's a challenge, but it ends up being very, very rewarding. And then after that, everything else just seems like a cakewalk, just really easy, really approachable, because all of a sudden you don't have that added pressure of trying to be funny. And there are these groups that are popping up all over. So Bright Club is the one that, that I participated in um, when I was in Scotland. Um, but then there's other groups across the US um, and other countries as well, such as Science Write It or, um, or Science Riot um, or Solve for X. And they've been popping up all over and they're, they're very active and um, they tend to be very fun experiences. So again, I that's an area of research that I'm interested in exploring of, you know, after somebody goes to a show like this, what is their, what is their change perceptions about science? Or do they have an increased curiosity after experience, experiencing science in this way? And then getting to the, the storytelling side of, of things. So, um, Again, this might be, um, it might seem like a new way of communicating, but if we think about it, we already do tell stories in science. If we go to that, you know, that formula that we all know, so IMRAD, introduction, methods, results, analysis, discussion, um, you know, that's a way of, of telling a story. And if we compared it to that traditional storytelling technique of, <clears throat> does it have a beginning? Does it have a middle? Does it have an end? Well, yes, the way that we write an academic journal is very much the same way that we tell a story. But if we wanted to do this in a way that that was less akin to that traditional journal article format, we could think about a simplified story approach. Um, and so this is where you think about, okay, in my work or in some of my experiments, what is the conflict? What is the problem? And then what is that aha moment where all of a sudden everything changes or everything improves or you have a clear path out? And then what is the resolution? So what did you learn from this process? How did, how did it get better? What conclusions did you draw? And that's really the three main ways that you can tell an effective story. Another way to think about it is this and, but, therefore approach. And so if anybody's read the book by Randy Olson, Don't Be So Cerebral, um, or no, sorry, Don't Be Such a Poor Storyteller. That's one of the chapters, Don't Be So Cerebral. Um, you know, he discusses this and, but, therefore approach. And it's also the same approach that's used by um, the creators of South Park. So you have, 
this event that happens and then something else happens but then this other thing happens therefore this happens and it's that same kind of conflict aha moment and resolution but it's another way of of thinking about how you could design a story where you have you know you walked into the lab one day um and you set out your materials to run an experiment but then you were out of a uh, solution so you decided that you had to um, make a new solution therefore you were able to carry out the experiment now that's a very boring straightforward story but if you can think about you know some of the things that you encounter on a daily basis, you could fit it into that structure and then design a story and edit it out to a way that's more engaging and, and more enticing, um, much more effectively than what I just did in the last 30 seconds. And if we think about the, the critical elements of telling a story and, and you know, if you wanted to build off of that and but therefore framework, think about the human aspects. So how did you get there? How did it feel? What were the emotions that you were going through? And what did you learn? You also want to consider the point of view. So this is your story. You want to make sure that you are in it, that you are the main character, and that you are present within each moment. And it's important to realize that these personal aspects, even though you think that you're unique to you, can really reveal a lot of universals that many of us go through. And as we think about how to make, um, make a story more engaging or a little bit more enticing, um, going back to that attention economy aspect, um, you can think about it as truth with emotion. So you don't want to lie, but there might be certain embellishments that are very descriptive. Um, such as feeling shocked or, or being surprised or, you know, an exaggeration in the form of a metaphor that really describes what you were going through. Um, and then adding some flair. So starting with a strong opening statement um, and where you really elaborate on a moment in a very, very descriptive way. Um, you know, a, um, a friend of mine always uses the example of, you know, you could say the story where your your bathtub fell through the ceiling. Um, but the way that she would describe it is, you know, she wiped away this dripping mess of hair to see the leg of her bathtub dangling through the ceiling and 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 she's saturated because all of this explosion of water and she's much more eloquent telling that story than I am. Um, but also you want to think about what is your inner monologue um, and remember that no one can hear a semicolon. So, you know, thinking about the way that you're speaking is very different than the way that you typically write. And so it's always good to, to practice these ideas out loud and, and share your stories and, and tell them over and over again. You also want to make sure that you get right down to the story. Um, so if you're thinking about telling a story about your your research or, or your work, um, you know, just remember you don't need backstory, you just need the story. So make sure that you strip away any extraneous details. And remember that this is really just a scene in the episode of your life. So think about it in terms of a single scene. We don't need the whole life story. And, you know, preamble is boring. Um, just kind of get right into it. And then, as I mentioned before, you want to make sure that you edit, edit, edit. Um, so really kind of going over these ideas and, and crafting a story in a way that's meaningful and easy to understand. And then another way that you could think about it, if you wanted much more structure in developing a story, you could use these classic story spines um, and you can just kind of enter in your, your initial idea using the classic story spine. So once upon a time, so that considers the background and you outline the setting of, of who you are. And then every day, and that's where you outline the overall problem. So what is, what is it that you're trying to solve? But then one day, um, and that's where you outline your solution or your idea. Then because of that, you have this plan to implement a solution. Um, but then whatever can will go wrong. And why did it go wrong? 
And then because of that, what has changed based on what you learned until finally you reach this resolution or the success. And then ever since then, wider changes, lesson learned, better society, et cetera. And then if you were to actually practice this as a group and get into breakout sessions, you could think about how you could provide feedback for each other. So, you know, as you listen to somebody's story, you want to ask yourself, was I engaged? Was I able to see the world through their eyes? What lingering questions do I have? Um, what details did I not care about so that they could be edited out? Um, did the person jump right in to the story or, or was there an extensive preamble? And then what details or moments would I like to have expanded upon um, or hear more about? And so, um, you know, and this is typically the criteria that I run through with my students when we start getting into storytelling and, and we run the storytelling workshops. But also thinking about this in terms of a learning experience. And so I've started to compare these aspects of, of humor and storytelling with the concept of transformative learning. So thinking about some of the work that's been done on transformative learning experiences where you know, if you think about transformative learning um, the learners try or start to kind of construe or validate reformulate the meaning of their experiences um, and also it helps enhance greater confidence significant change in their self-concept relationships and or lifestyle and humor Again, I'm using the same quote from earlier that deconstructs social meaning, allowing us better insight into otherwise invisible structures. And also using storytelling, especially in a venue that's not traditional or informal, really helps get people excited and interested in, in science. And to be part of that is a very exciting process. And some of the concepts that we see, especially when looking at some of the barriers to engagement with science is that there's there are barriers in terms of people's perceived self-efficacy as well as their identity where they may be resistant to learning about scientific information especially if they've been told at a very young age they're not good at science um, and so taking or combining humor and storytelling with transformative learning helps build people back up and makes interactions with scientific information much more approachable. That doesn't kind of cause a threat to their self-efficacy or their perceived identity. And so this kind of summarizes the observations that I've been able to um, gather through the storytelling and, and stand-up comedy workshops that I've run with my students and, and how they compare with the transformative learning framework. Um, and so I apologize in advance for the very text heavy kind of table here, but um, you know, some of these quotes I found to be very powerful from the, what students wrote after experiencing these workshops that I've run with them on, on stand-up comedy and storytelling. And this is after they've, they've performed. So they, they learn about how to do these techniques um, much in the way that I've shared with you today. And then, and then they go off and do it. Um, and then they come back and, and perform in front of the entire class. And so it's going through this experience that they start to have these changes um, in terms of their um, political views, their moral views, intellectual views. And then I have three more on the next slide, but I wanna give you all a chance to just see kind of these outcomes from the students. Um, where they, you know, they start to feel a sense of community. Um, the, the next row down, everyone found many things in common that we never would have thought to discuss without these spontaneous stories. Um, I love the, the bottom one. I think that, that these are, um, miscon that there are misconceptions that science must always be correct. However, however, most scientists often make tons of mistakes before arriving at satisfactory results. And embracing those mistakes is what allows us to grow. Um, so I just think that's a very powerful outcome from engaging in this type of workshop. Um, and then again, changing people's cultural perspectives, their personal perspectives, as well as their spiritual perspectives. 
Um, and so again, looking at that, that bottom quote, storytelling allows us to build connections with others in a more intimate and humanizing way. So we, even though I've, I've had a very limited experience in, in sharing these practices with, with students, the, the outcomes have been very valuable to me. Um, and I think they, they are very powerful. Um, and so that's pretty much everything that I have for you. So I'm hoping that you all have, have questions um, or comments. My, my ultimate goal is to turn this into a course. Um, so I've been slowly kind of building up that, um, that background to try and turn this into, into a course. Um, and thank you, Ari, for sharing that, the Story Collider podcast. I'll have to check that out. I love the moth. Thank you, Danielle. I have to agree. I love the moth as well. So thank you very much. And uh, we welcome people to um, completely unmute and ask your questions or um, add a comment like Ari did on the Story Collider podcast. So we welcome your questions. Um, go ahead and unmute and um, ask Danielle whatever you like. Can I jump in with another comment? Please do. So Danielle, I don't know if, you, if you've seen it, but uh, a book that, that might be handy for you to use is, um, it's this one's called Out on the Wire by Jessica Abel. Okay. And it's about storytelling, particularly within radio. Mm -hmm. um, it's really great. And it's also in graphic novel format. So it goes down really That's well cool. in textbook. So, um, but a lot of the things you're talking about are, are, are touched on in there and they're uh, um, variations on viewpoints. I think, I think it really resonates a lot of what you were saying really resonated with my experience of the book, and I think we'd go the other direction too. So mm -hmm. It's really cool. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, none of these ideas are novel. I mean, they're 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 things that I've just collected along the way from my interactions with others, and I would just I would love to, I would you know I'd love to actually have my own stand up group here at Cornell and and work with researchers and and help them do this. But you know, like I said, I I got the idea from participating in Bright Club and just looking at some of the literature out there. And so I, I love it, but I, I can't claim any of this as my own. <laughs> so. No, but the, the assemblage of, of, of old knowledge is in fact new knowledge, right? That's, you know, taking a lot of stuff that's out there, diverse things that are out there and pulling them together and making them, giving them a, a, a schema and giving them, making them available to people is itself um, the generation of new knowledge and it's super duper important. Thank you. Danielle, I, I, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think it was great. I'm a video producer, and when we're doing videos, we follow the exact same formula that you have. Is what is the problem? How did you go about solving it? What kinds of issues did you have along the way? And what was your conclusion? And now, what is that? How does that change things? I mean, we've done that. If you have a, an hour long feature, or you have a seven minute video, it's the same story. So. Mm -hmm. It's really nice to hear that and, and see the framework that's behind it because it's it's kind of practical learning after trying all the other alternatives that didn't work. <laughs> yeah, it was it was something that um you know this was really popular at um at the COP. So I, I recently went to the um the COP climate negotiations mm -hmm. in Glasgow, and a lot of the um a lot of the sessions that were focused on on climate change communication and, and public engagement were again um, really focused on storytelling and and humanizing the the knowledge and and building stronger connections between uh, the general public and and experts and and really trying to bridge that gap so it was you know much like you it felt very validating to to see other people doing this mm -hmm. same type of work um, so yeah, it feels good. So Danielle, I have a question. Um, you had mentioned at the start that um, you, you know the age-old tried and true way for scientists to convey their results is journal articles, which typically are written for fellow researchers and are not accessible by the general public or you know anybody without access to Taylor Francis, etc. So do you see this? In, um, in your, particularly in your students, 
starting to become a, a more common way of conveying their, you know, results, their studies, or um, you know, whatever, and becoming more accepted as to sticking to the oh, you must write a journal article, and if you're not writing journal articles, you're not producing. But here's a way to actually reach beyond the research <coughs> and reach the general public. Um, I I've in some of my interactions with different editors for journals, they are interested in exploring these other opportunities, but I haven't yet seen a, a shift where, you know, let's say the in the tenure process, this is not as valued as the traditional journal article, you know, publish or perish type of uh, process, but there is interest. Um, not again, not necessarily not necessarily from the university perspective, but I think the students are very interested in it. They they find it rewarding, and they think it it helps not just in kind of thinking about it in terms of networking or or job interviews, but also in talking to their families about the the things that they're studying because that's one of the questions I often ask them. Uh, the very beginning of class or at the be beginning of the semester, you know, how many of you are able to talk about what you are studying here with your families? And maybe two people raise their hand out of, you know, it's it's a small class. There's only 30 in there. But, you know, it's, I see that every year that I've taught this class is they really don't have a strong um, strong method for talking to their families you know the the people that they're closest to about the things that they're studying and i think that's um you know being able to talk to them in a way that's meaningful is, is impactful for them you know, and i've started to do that with my other courses where one assignment is to talk to someone in their family about a concept that they learned in class and some of them will record it and then submit that to me, which I never asked for. So I was surprised to receive that, but uh, <laughs> you start to, you know, you're almost like a fly on the wall in these very deep, meaningful conversations between a, a student and their, their parents or their, their siblings. And I think it, it's, it's very rewarding and they end up walking away feeling really fantastic. Um, I have a question. Go ahead, uh, this is, yeah, this is Shen. Uh, I'm a research associate at the science education department. So my question is, uh, what suggestion do you have for scientists to become more Can scientists be more sensitive to that so we remember it and then eventually we can tell a good story about it right how how do we collect and gather these little stories in our lives mm -hmm. i think possibly adding that to your lab notebook you know if you're if you're still you know i'm assuming that you that scientists are still you know, writing things down in that traditional lab notebook type of way. But I, I think that that could be a great way to just make a little note of something that was unique that happened that day beyond just the, the, the bench work or the, the protocol that was followed that day. And, and you know, that's another thing that I have my students do is they, they have a daily writing journal where they just have to write for five minutes every day and they then go back and look at it and they see see their experiences and it's only through a semester it's a small period of time but they find that very rewarding as well so we, i think that journaling can be very powerful and if you're already writing your day down in a lab notebook um, that could be a great way to to pay attention to some of those things and and um, and gather them as you, as you mentioned. So Danielle, we have a couple more questions um, from Eric and then um, Ruchu, if you wanna unmute and go ahead and ask. 
that that was a great talk on science communication and i thought your view graph about in science we already tell stories you have the beginning the middle and the end you know what is the problem what did we do to solve the problem and what results we found uh, that's the outline for the introduction of every paper and then the rest of the paper fills in the details so that's a great summary but the um, title of your talk had something to do with comedy. And I wonder if you had something more to say about comedy in science. Uh, how do you do this? What, um, what's a good approach? Um, one of the problems is that when one gives a talk, you don't have very much time, you know, so you can't stray from um, the message that you want to deliver with comedy. And secondly, it's very risky. It's kind of hard to get it right. Um, did you have, could you help out with that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, the, um, I'll go back to that general framework. So this is, and again, this is the, the training that I received, and it, it's, it is very abstract. And you kind of have to, as you know, as Chen mentioned, collecting some of those moments and then thinking about them in a way where you can compare and contrast them to your unique per, unique experiences with people's everyday experiences. And that might be very specific to the audience that you're engaging with. So, you know, this would be very risky at say a, a traditional conference where you're presenting in that traditional format. I think it's very difficult to be humorous in in that type of format just because of the expectation and the culture and the context. Uh, but if you were at um was I was at when I did my stand-up comedy, um, it's an entirely different environment where people are, are already on your side and you, you know that going in. Like they're they're ready to laugh. Um, and so as you start to think about language and you write down your story that you want to turn into something humorous, um, you know, you use this framework of comparing and contrasting, making the unfamiliar familiar, making it human and leaning into your personality, and then thinking about those words that you could um, play around with. And so even though I kind of showed you this very brief uh, experience of getting this type of training and then thinking about the themes in my own research and then performing in a club that happened over a period of, of three weeks and I spent hours writing the content for an eight minute stand up bit. Um, so it, it's it's again thinking about some of those storytelling techniques and then adapting it and editing it. And I, I bored my roommate to tears because I kept, you know, anytime I saw him, I said, will you listen to this again? Will you listen to this again? <laughs> um, and so it, it's, you know, it's kind of taking the time and brainstorming those ideas and, and playing around with words that is really probably the most helpful. Okay, thanks. I'll think about that. So Rutu and then Erica. Thank you. Hi, that was a really interesting talk and please excuse the bright sunlight behind me. Um, I wanted to ask, so I'm Rutu Das. I am actually working on telling stories of discovery in astronomy um, for a wide audience. And I, I mean, my instinct was that, yes, I should make them somewhat witty or humorous, you know, to get them, uh, you know, get people to uh, relate to them. I mean, there's, of course, there's the human side of things, like we're showing the human side of the scientists who made the discoveries and all of that. Um, my particular question was on like adding humor. Um, given that this is like an audio, uh, this is an audio recording, it's not live. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you gauge what kind of things will actually relate to an audience? I mean, I know that's a very broad question and my instinct is just like, well, you have to try it and see if it resonates with people. But do you have any particular advice for, or you know, any resources that help like actually gauge this? Um, really practicing 
with people and, and talking to people, um, that is the most helpful is just talking to others. I mean, and, and seeing their reaction and then asking, you know, what do you think about this and brainstorming ideas and, um, you know, I guess trying to compare and con I, I keep going back to compare and contrast and like thinking about astronomy, I'm thinking like, oh, you know, someone in the what 1700s or, you know, Kepler or whoever and staring up and all of a sudden you're imagining yourself as this, the seeker of worlds and that could be humorous and probably something that most of us have um you know could relate to especially as a young child like you're exploring the unknown and and being you know exaggerating that it could be something that's you know approachable and possibly non-offensive um you know and, and <laughs> <laughs> because again, it, it it can be very um, delicate to walk that type of of line. Um, so I, I tend to think of you know maybe if I were to imagine myself as a child and and exploring that for the first time and what am I thinking and and even trying to imagine what someone is thinking as they're doing that could be humorous and and over exaggerated and that could probably be a really approachable way to to do that thank you erica reinfeld go ahead hi there uh thank you so much danielle i have two questions that are perhaps a little bit related so when i think about stand-up comedy a lot of it is often building up to a particular punchline. Um, that you deliver and then transition into the, the next bit. And I was struck by a lot of what you said about this is very, this is used very successfully in the political realm. And so I'm wondering whether you've looked at memes as a method for, these are the things that they just spread so quickly and they have done this distilling of humor into a single idea. Um, that has a lot of power to spread and then sort of connected to that. I'm also wondering if you've looked into some of the anti-science humor that's out there that perpetuates and that undermines a lot of this public trust in science and science communication. So I'm wondering if you've come across that in your work. Yeah, I, um, I haven't looked at it formally in terms of the literature on it, but uh, I have my class create memes um, as a form of science communication, um, and you know, so they and they they love it. They get really into it, so they love making science memes, and they they come up with some really fantastic ideas. Um, the one space or one one time that I have looked at the anti science memes is I have a, a research project I've been working on. Um, and I'm still analyzing the data. Um, so it's very early days, but I've been looking at um, environmental influencers on Instagram and then looking at the anti or the, you know, the climate deniers on Instagram and they all use memes. Like the, the, the climate deniers on Instagram just use memes. The environmental influencers have a completely different approach. So it, that's been one uh, outcome that's been very interesting. But again, I haven't kind of put that in the context of the, the current literature. I think that's really interesting, especially that the approaches are different because I th think that's often, politically speaking, at least where we have disconnect in the ways that we communicate and the ways that we disseminate information. And it taps into what you were saying about ivory tower and um, expectations and trust and all of that. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll have to, it, it's a great idea to look into that more. So I appreciate that. Thank you. We have any other questions from anybody today? Uh, I have another question. Uh, when I think back about the uh, political comedy shows, uh, many of them has like a cynical flavor from their you know, storytelling and jokes. And it's funny, but also you feel sense, a sense of uh, powerlessness that, oh, if everybody is so stupid, then uh, I, I should just give up on this system. It, uh, uh, but in a humorous way, but like, oh, how do you deal with this uh, potential of uh, 
uh, of a cynical tone and cynical implication, and and or do you think that's just uh, that's just part of it? So. I I think giving people something to do is a great way to overcome that, and that's one of the unique characteristics of. John Oliver and his television show that even though he does present a very cynical perspective and uses a lot of comedy, he often has a specific call to action so that people do feel as they, though they are achieving something and, and, and providing or helping in a solution. I think the, the best example of that is when John Oliver did the, um, his, episodes on net neutrality, and then told the audience to provide public comment. So when the FCC had um, their uh, positions on revoking net neutrality open for public comment, John Oliver did a segment and said, go put your comments down and say that you do not want um, the policies retracted. And so they ended up, so many people did it that the FCC website crashed um, multiple times because so many people felt empowered to go and do what John Oliver gave them to do. Um, you know, and I'm sure that could have its own negative impacts, but you know, I think that, you know, we see this so often in, in climate change communication is that people want to know what to do. And I think with science communication, it's less of an issue, but I think that could be helpful if we were to take some of these approaches that, you know, yeah, this information is nice to know, but it's also great to give people something to then carry forward. John Raymond, go ahead. Hi. Um... I just wanted to say that as far as the uh, what we were just talking about, the uh, comedy shows and so on, uh, at the very beginning, you talked about superiority as being one of the forms or reasons for humor. And I think that is part of the problem, that it is often very counterproductive, uh, that many people will actually identify with the person who's being made fun of, whether it's Donald Trump or George Bush or something like that. And that uh, is uh, maybe a counterproductive sort of humor. Yeah, absolutely. I agree that the um, you know superiority theory is one of the more negative approaches to humor. Um, and so I I included that as an example for the negative ways that humor is used. But I think that relief theory is much more of the the approach that that I would use if I were to apply humor to some of my uh, science communications. Go ahead, Phil. Hi, this is Phil Sadler. Hi, um, I, I, I've had some experiences using comedy in the presentation and wanted to know if you have any thoughts about this, this particular phenomena, which is, um, I usually take something pretty commonplace for teachers, like questions they ask of their students, and um, uh, and then um, show a video interview or the start of a video interview with with a student answering that question, um, and it usually sort of goes according to the teacher's plan that student gives, you know, some answer that the teacher recognizes. And then um, uh, I break and have um, uh, the audience discuss what's going to happen next in, in the interview. And so they get very invested in predicting what this particular student is going to say, usually on the basis of the student's appearance or eloquence or uh, you know some something uh, something not much to do with uh, uh, their reasoning and then when you show the at the, the second part of the interview and you the teachers find that they're so far off base that they thought this brilliant student was just going to get everything right and they're 
uh, uh, flabbergasted that there's uh, something else going on in the student's mind. It, it, um, it seems to have a big effect, especially when I talk about you know, student ideas where teachers think they know what their students' ideas are, but they never really interview their students to figure out their ideas. So I'm, I'm wondering whether, if you have anything to say about this approach of doing something commonplace and where people have certain expectations and then the expectation is sort of blown to bits uh, <laughs> by, that, by an actual video of, of, uh, of uh, uh, people talking about their ideas. Yeah, it, it, you know, that uh, appeals to that incongruity theory where you know, it's just totally unexpected. And, and, and I think that's a, a great approach and in a, a very safe and in a relatable way. So I think that that's fantastic. And um, I'd love to see it in action. It, oh, okay. <laughs> I can just imagine the whole room of people, you know, bursting out laughing because they all have these certain expectations and then it doesn't match. And, <laughs> and, 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 and then there, there are always a few teachers or scientists in the audience who, who defend their position that they were actually right when they were like totally in, in their prediction, when they were actually totally and absolutely wrong. And people look at them like they have three heads and yet they're, they're defending that they got it right, even though that they, they were accurate in their prediction, even though nothing of the sort is going on. <laughs> That's so, really great. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Okay. <laughs> Sean Raymond, did you have another question? Your hand is still up. Nope. Anybody else have a question or comment for Danielle? I had one. Um, sorry, I shouldn't put my hand up. What is, uh, tell us something, tell us something funny about climate change. What can we use? Is there a good <laughs> joke on climate change? <laughs> I have a fantastically terrible joke. Um, <laughs> uh, what did the air conditioner say about climate change? I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> so awful. <laughs> well, any other questions for Danielle? I'm not seeing any hands or hearing anyone speak up. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank Danielle Eisman once again for a very engaging and interesting um, presentation on um, using comedy and storytelling to convey um, science. And um, I hope you've all got something that you can take away from this. So thank you once again, Danielle, and we appreciate everybody attending. And we'll see you in February. <laughs>